So I'm going to chat to you guys a bit today about something that wasn't quite right. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have, uh, in your day jobs, been looking at metrics and graphs and, you know, sometimes you just see something that's not quite right going on and you kind of look at it and you go, wow, I'd really like to have a little peek at what's going on there, but often there's more important things going on, burning issues, things like that. And so this is kind of the story of when I had a look at something that wasn't quite working and even though it wasn't causing any issues, I thought it was worth a bit of a deep dive to go and have a look at what's going on. So this is our pet Python service at TechLot and it's about 200,000 lines of code, 79 Python libraries, does it around 80 requests a second per backend, we've got quite a few of them, and it's running Python 2.7. I know there's a new Python app, someone told me about it once, um, we'll use it one day. And so we run G-Unicorn and Tornado in parts of it as well. So the graph I was looking at was this particular one where we have a CPU usage and we see the green is system and the blue is user and it's just kind of sitting flatlining at 100% or so. So it's using just over one of the CPU cores but it really shouldn't be. Um, there was an accompanying graph with this, but I didn't capture it at the time, which is actually the load average. And the load average was showing somewhere around uh, 20 or so, but we'll have a look at that in a second. So th in terms of the API working, everything was actually functioning perfectly. Um, we, the requests per second were good, the response time was good. We we're actually generally pretty happy with how everything was looking. But there's just this really irritating alert going off every like half hour or so. And so we wanted to have a look and fix that. So before we kind of go on any journey in investigating what's going on, we do a little pre-flight check. So you land on a server, you just want to make sure that the usual things are okay and working. And so there's quite a few little things you just check on when you get on the server for the first time. So the first one is usually disk space. So hopefully everyone knows to check disk space. Uh, you just check the usual DF. Uh, what some people don't really check often is the inodes though. So if you're on something like an image server, which has a couple million images on it, uh, checking the inodes is often a really good thing to do as well. Um, and for those that don't know, the inodes are storing the metadata for files on your file system. So if you run out of inodes, you can't create any more files either. The next one to check is networking. So we use a socket stats tool, SS, and we just have a quick look through the kind of what's the state of the networking. Um, in this particular case, uh, this is taken just from a laptop at a different time, so this wasn't at the time of the issue, unfortunately. But this is just the usual thing of what's going on. We've got a couple of connected connections, a few closed, uh, fortunately no orphaned, um, and a couple in time wait, which means that the connections have kind of finished, but now they're just waiting to make sure that the other end of the connection doesn't come and send us any more traffic after that. Uh, VM stat is a really, really great general purpose. Let's see what the state of the system is. Uh, so I passed the SM flag, which says let's use megabytes for the memory uh, part of the output. And then it dumps the output every one second. So starting on the left, we've got the number of running processes. And again, this isn't from the actual issue. This is just an example of the VM stat tool. I didn't capture this at the time either. So We've got one or two running processes. The B stands for blocked, so this is the same as a process that's in the D state when you run PS. So this is something that's waiting for IO or something to that effect. Swap D is our allocated swap memory, um, or swapping on disk anyway. Free is the amount of free memory. Buffers and cache is something that not a lot of people really invest time into looking at. But this is essentially the kernel saying it's buffering when it writes to disk or it's buffering when it's reading from disk as well. Uh, swap, so that's swap in and swap out. So if your system is swapping, these are really two to pay attention to. Uh, a lot of people use free and they look at the swap usage there, which isn't quite correct. The, this is a much better metric to tell you whether there's actually swap being written to and from the disk at the time. The IO is just a good overview of bytes going in and out of the disks. Uh, then we move on to the CPU kind of side and we start with interrupts, so interrupts being your general hardware and software interrupts. Then we have context switching where uh, processes 
are swapped in and out for other processes. And then finally on the system, we have our user system idle and wait, which I'll touch on in a second. So we've done our pre-flight checks and we now are kind of more ready to go into the actual investigation of what's going wrong. So from now on, I've got quite a few screenshots and uh, captures from the investigation as we went through it. So yeah, I'll have those and go through it in some more detail. So load average. A lot of people I find are a bit confused about what load average really means. Uh, it's some sort of magical number. And it is, in fact, quite well defined as uh, the number of tasks that are in the run queue and they're ready to run. So if you have two CPUs and you have a load of two, you're actually good to go. You're using the CPU as efficiently as you can. Anything over two means that you've got things ready to run and your CPUs don't have the capacity to run it. So in this particular case, we can run LS CPU and we see that we're on a machine with two CPUs. So we're in a really bad place at this time. Um, so at the moment, we've got two things running and we've got about 20 things sitting waiting to run. Moving on to tasks, so there's a bit of a um, discrepancy in how people define tasks, but for the sake of top, it's the number of processes. So we've got 132 processes in the system. Of those, we've got 24 running, um, so they're ready to run, which is, matches with our load, and quite a few sleeping, but no stopped, no zombie, so those are looking fine. So moving on to CPU, user and system. So this is where we match up with the graph. Um, so we already kind of know about those two. Uh, it's good to see that the nice is zero. So, well, not good, but we don't nice anything on the service. That's fine. And the idle being zero, that's our real problem. So this CPU is wasting no cycles. Moving on to wait. This is our usual suspect for load. So anyone who's kind of debugged a load issue has almost certainly pinned it back to uh, disk I.O., network I.O., something like that. In our case, our wait time is zero, so it's probably not a network issue, probably not a disk issue, so it's something else is weird going on. Uh, the last, or the second last two here are hardware and system, hardware and software interrupts. So these should always be really, really low. Um, so a percentage of 1.2 for, for software interrupts is actually quite high. Um, may not look at for most people, but when you, if you see uh, software interrupts at 1.2, it's actually relatively high and something to just kind of put a flag next to. Uh, the last one here is stolen. So we run on Zen, and this percent here means that we are competing with another virtual machine. So 0.2% of the CPU time is currently being lost to another, C another virtual machine, which maybe that's within our limits. It's okay. So we've got a good overview of what's going on. Um, at this point, I'm going to switch to PS. And I have this long PS command in one of my clipboard managers. Um, and it's quite handy for having a quick look at what's going on from the process point of view. So the A and the X are pretty common. That's for showing all processes and it lifts, lifts some BSD style restrictions on PS. Uh, F is for showing the various forks, so you see how the processes are forked off each other. Then O is just to output some custom uh, headings. So we look at the parent process, we look at the process ID, look at the waiting channel, the thread count, and the status and the command. The waiting channel is probably not a very common one that people look at. I find it quite interesting just to put on um, this command. The waiting channel is essentially when a process goes to sleep, it gets put into a waiting channel. And the waiting channel lets, is kind of like a, a trigger. So when an event go, happens onto the waiting channel, then it notifies all processes that are waiting on that waiting channel. And then they'll, be, they'll go into their next kind of ready to run. So we can kind of see if there are sleeping processes, what are they waiting on. In this, in this particular case, we can't see the whole waiting channel, but it's poll select, I think it is. And the rest of the processes, they're all running. The interesting thing to notice from here is that we have a whole bunch of running processes. So that's where our load is coming from, um, a whole bunch of things in the run queue. And more interesting for me is the number of threads. So 40 to 50 threads for 
this particular application is very unexpected. We're not expecting to see uh, that many threads because we don't really use threads in our application. Um, there's not a lot of people that are using it, so to have that means that there's some library or something weird going on that's actually spawning up a whole bunch of threads. So we're going to have a look at that. Okay, so in Python, we add some logging. There's a nice uh, threading function where you can just enumerate all of the threads. And so we do that in the process, and once a minute, we just go and dump out all the threads. And what we found is that we're using a library called PyKafka. And PyKafka is our library that we're using for Kafka. And Kafka, if you don't know, is an event bus similar to like RabbitMQ and things like that. And PyKafka was spinning up a thread per broker, per topic, um, and consumer, something to that effect. So it kind of like multiplied out. So if you had one topic with five partitions and four consumers, you'd end up with 30 or 40 threads. So that was pretty bad news. But that itself isn't really a symptom for the CPU. It's just a symptom, and it doesn't really explain the CPU usage yet. So to dig a little bit deeper, I plotted it on a few different areas and landed on this command. Uh, also not a very common command, but essentially it looks at the statistics for a particular process. So the T shows the thread information, the W shows the uh, context switching information, uh, P for process ID, and then again it dumps out every one second. This is just one second's output, and what it shows us is the how much the context switching has changed from second to second. So what we see here is one worker with just 20 of its threads. Um, and there's actually about 45 threads on this worker. So not all the outputs here, just for the one worker. We've got another 40 of them. And what we see is context switches in two forms. So there's context switch, and then there's the non-voluntary context switch. For those who don't know the context switch is when you take an application, and it said, I'm yielding to the CPU. And at that point, the kernel will take it out of memory and out of the CPU pipeline and schedule the next one in there. So it's quite an intensive process um, where registers are kind of swapped out, memory maps are swapped out, etc. And it takes roughly in the order of a few microseconds. So in our case, though, <coughs> we're doing about 30 to 150 uh, context switches in a second for each thread. And non-voluntary is pretty low. So just to sum that up, so we've got 30 to 150 context switches. Those are the voluntary ones, and 40, 45 threads. And that gives us roughly about 100,000 context switches a second. And if we average that out over the number of uh, threads and things that we actually have, it means that the Linux schedule is giving us maybe about 0.01 milliseconds of CPU time every second per thread, which is really not a lot of time to do any work. So it still doesn't really answer much of a question. It's just given us more of an in, like a insight into what's going on. So context switching is definitely an issue. And I think it explains the system CPU usage. So context switching takes a lot of resources to swap out uh, resources, to swap out like CPU registers, et cetera. And um, that all sits in the kernel, kernel space th side of functions and would use the system usage. But it doesn't quite explain why we're doing so many voluntary switches. So a voluntary context switch is when the application has said, I'm yielding the CPU. It's not when it's been forced off. That's the non-voluntary. So we've got a lot of threads saying, I've done some work for 0 0.01 milliseconds, and I'm ready to give back the CPU now. And that's using all of our CPUs. So we've got a lot of things saying, I don't want to do any work, but it's getting work anyway. So we dig a little bit deeper, and we jump into a tool called S-Trace. Um, so this is your system tracing utility. And I run it with a couple of flags. So dash C is for doing a report style format. So you can also do a tail of the output. The dash F is for looking at forks. So Anytime the process forks, it'll follow those forks along as well. Uh, dash P, again, just attaches to the particular process we're looking at. So what we see here is a you know, percent of time spent and how many seconds that equates to, how many microseconds on average each call took, how many calls there were, errors, and then what system call was being called. So I ran this over just about 10 seconds. So what we can see is that 90% of the time was spent doing a select statement 
and that select statement was taking about five milliseconds. And then the other 10% of the time was spent doing a few ticks. And so the definition is there. So the select is kind of monitoring file descriptors, usually used for networking, um, that sort of thing. And the few text is more used as a semaphore. So if you're a developer, semaphore is for kind of managing shared access to memory. So we've got some sort of thing where something's looking at shared memory and something's looking at networking. I would suspect networking is actually pretty normal for our application. It's doing a lot of network calls, database calls, Kafka calls, etc. But the few text looks a little bit odd to me. So we go one level deeper and we open up GDB. At this point, uh, it's not a point you usually like to get to when you're debugging, but it gets kind of gnarly. And we jump into it and we look at the threads. I know you guys can't read this, so I'll have a quick breeze through what's going on here. So right at the bottom is your active thread. And in that active thread, it's currently doing something with a dictionary and a string in Python. And that's fine, that's like normal work. Then we've got a whole bunch of threads sitting in semaphore weight. And that's probably related to our few text thing, and it's something a bit weird that's going on there. We also see that as part of the lib thread library. So this is something to do with threading. Something to do with threading, something to do with Python, and something to do with semaphores. So we open up one of those threads, we attach to it, and we do a backtrace. For those who aren't developers, a backtrace essentially gives us the call stack, saying how did we get to this point? So we've got to a semaphore wait, but we're gonna say like, what made me go into this wait state? And in the backtrace, we come across this function, which comes from the, the Python internals, called restore thread. And restore thread is basically the Python global interpreter lock. And for those that don't know, the Python the global interpreter lock is quite a famous part of Python. It's present in a couple other languages as well. And essentially it's to do with how Python manages threading. And Python is not thread safe. And so it, it has this big global lock that says only one Python process can execute at any one time, or one Python thread, sorry, um, at any one time. And it manages this through one big lock. So if you're a Python process and you, or you're a Python thread, you need to have the lock in order to do any work. So to explain this a little bit, we took a very um, contrived example of a Python process with four threads. Blue would represent the, uh, the global interpreter lock. So in the first part of the time, the first thread has the lock and then it kind of moves on and then repeats as it gets scheduled around. The thing is that the, the global interpreter lock is not the only thing that is at play here. We've also got the, the kernel. So the kernel also schedules CPU into time slices in a similar way. And so I've represented the kernel scheduler with white, and we're now competing with a bunch of other processes. So our top four is our Python application, our Python process, and the other ones are a bunch of other processes. And so what happens is after the fourth schedule, the rest of the process then get their turn, and there's a big gap in, the, in our code where it sits and waits for time to be scheduled to it. Unfortunately, that's, more, that's quite a contrived example where what would happen is you have the lock just long enough to do all of your work and that's fine. But what happens is if you don't have quite enough CPU time to finish what you need to do, you won't give up the global interpreter lock. So Python uses 100 ticks basically, which is 100 Python instructions. And if you don't finish your work in that time, then it doesn't give up the global interpreter lock. What happens after that is that when the rest of your threads come to run, they try and get the global interpreter lock and they fail. So they, they try and acquire the lock and Python says no and they do a voluntary switch. So this is basically what's happening in our case. So what we're dealing with is contention. Well, wow, that grade didn't come out well. Um, so we have 45 threads and we're contending for the global interpreter lock within our Python process. So with just within our process, we've got 45 threads going and saying, can we have an interpreter lock? Then we've got 40 processes that are doing exactly the same thing. So that's giving us like 1,600 threads competing for the OS and competing for the global interpreter lock in Python. 
which is basically leading to a whole bunch of contention. The examples are given here are a little bit uh, contrived. The scheduler is actually a lot more complex. It's a red black tree and there's a bunch of context here on multi-CPU and numer proce uh, process affinity, C groups, things like that, that are kind of ignored, um, which would just complicate everything. So our reality is that we have 100,000 context switches where we're giving up the CPU, and really this is just wasted effort. So we've solved the problem. We know what it is. We're pretty stoked, <laughs> but now we want to fix it. So the unfortunate thing is that the fix was real easy. So instead of our 40 workers, we dropped it to four workers. We thought contention and con we thought concurrency would be an issue, but it turns out in fact that four workers could serve the concurrency more than well enough for our needs, and all the wasted cycles were actually just causing us more pain and frustration than we needed. So the second change we made is we dumped the library. We replaced it with another library called RD Kafka. And this is a much more official library. It wasn't out and wasn't as mature at the time. And this just uses two threads. So the RD Kafka library took us from 40 threads down to two threads, and that reduced the gil contention massively. So with those two changes, um, the load dropped to 0 0.1 again, and CPU usage um, also like fell off the charts, and we're all back to normal. I didn't manage to capture those charts, unfortunately, though. The last two things I wanted to mention was we took it one step further, and we wanted to see if we could visualize exactly what is going on with our API. So we used one of the new tools that uh, Will's going to be chatting to us a little bit about later, um, called PerfTools. And in here, you can record exactly what's going on in the Linux kernel. And it kind of creates this uh, record, and we record it at 99 hertz. So 99 times a second, we go and record a stack dump of a process um, and put it into a file. Then we create a report from it, and we can generate a flame graph. And these are really cool. So it lets us visualize exactly what's going on inside our application. And we can kind of see nice and visually now that we've got the global interpreter lock, and there's its kind of call stack there. Uh, then we've got the main Python opcode interpreter sitting in the middle, taking quite a lot of time. And then the rest of the stuff is really all application bits and pieces running. So yeah, it's a really great tool to go and investigate if you want to go even one level deeper and visualize exactly what's going on. And yeah, so that's it. All done.